Welcome back to the channel. Today we're going to talk about why retaining walls collapse and specifically what's wrong with my retaining wall that caused it to fail. All right, so let's start with what a retaining wall is. It is a wall that retains, and what is it retaining? The weight of the dirt behind it and whatever happens to be in that dirt, which is typically water from when it rains. But more than that, if you're in a cold climate like I am in New England, during the winter, any water that's retained there is gonna freeze, it's going to push out even more as that water expands, and it's gonna put additional forces into that retaining wall. So generally speaking, there's two things that cause a retaining wall to collapse, and they're both pretty closely related. Number one is that it wasn't built to support the amount of weight that it's currently supporting. Or worded differently, the wall wasn't built strong enough or with the right materials to support the amount of dirt or whatever that it's holding up behind it. And problem number two, which is very closely related, is if there's too much weight behind the wall, even if it was initially built strong enough for what it was supporting. And you might say, well, if there's too much weight behind it, doesn't that just mean it wasn't strong enough? Well, not necessarily. The wall could have been strong enough when the wall was first built, but sometimes there's environmental Environmental factors that will add additional weight over time. And I'll cover these in more detail momentarily, but typically something like a tree growing immediately behind the wall can add a substantial amount of weight. Or more commonly, there's inadequate drainage, you get water buildup, and then that water weight and the freezing and expansion also apply additional force. Now, if you really wanted to, you could add a third reason, which is just physical damage. If someone crashes into the wall, if you have a tree root that physically grows through it. But if something physically broke the wall, yeah, obviously it's going Going to break, so we're not going to cover that in a lot of detail today. So let's start with the first reason that this wall failed, which is not being strong enough. Something I want to clarify real quick is the way that the wall is built and the way that it needs to be reinforced is highly dependent on the materials that are used. But here on this wall made of cinder block, there's supposed to be a piece of rebar every four feet for reinforcement, and that's just a metal rod. You pour concrete around it, and that basically links all the layers of the wall together, thereby increasing the strength from top to bottom. And it Again, that's supposed to be fully enclosed in concrete. But instead of spacing every four feet, whoever built this wall decided, hey, you know what? Seven to eight feet, that's plenty close. And beyond that, they didn't even use proper rebar. So you can see a piece of rebar here. This is actual rebar. It's got this really textured surface and that helps it grab onto the concrete and gives it a stronger bond so things move around less. And you'll see over in this corner, they just used a pipe that they pulled from the basement of the house. And before you say, okay, Okay, well maybe they were just trying to save money, I don't know how expensive this rebar stuff is. That roughly four foot piece of rebar would have been a maybe five dollar expense. That is the first major structural issue this wall had. Number two is that the wall itself needs as much weight as possible if it's a vertical cinder block wall like this to help better counter the force of the dirt pushing against the back. For example, over here where I've got these landscaping blocks, those have an interlock on the back which prevents one layer from sliding past the other because that lip is catching it. That's an extra layer of support to prevent the top layers from pushing past the bottom. When you have a vertical wall made of cinder block, you don't have that, so the weight on the inside is more essential. But the other thing is that cinder blocks are hollow, whereas a lot of landscaping blocks are solid, and solid blocks are obviously more heavy because there's not a giant hole in the center of them. So what you're supposed to do to add more of that weight and structure back into it is you fill the holes in the hollow spaces inside of the wall using sand, using gravel, or using concrete. It's the same thing if you have a hollow landscaping block, you're supposed to fill it with some sort of a gravel at the end to give it a little bit more weight. And because the gravel doesn't really condense between layers and move a whole lot, it has a similar effect as the rebar where you're getting a little bit more support between those layers of bricks. The landscaping blocks I have here are actually hollow, but these are all gravel filled. And even though these are about the same age as the cinder block wall, this is holding up much better with absolutely no deformation. By contrast, if you go over to the wall that failed, everywhere that they had the rebar, you'll see a little bit of concrete, but not concrete along the whole length of it because they didn't do a good job of filling it in properly. But beyond that, every other hole here is entirely unfilled and left hollow. You can see that it's hollow, 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 the entire way down. Which, needless to say, is the opposite of being filled up like it's supposed to be to give it better support. And I want to make it clear, I'm not saying it's bad to use hollow blocks, they're a lot lighter to carry, they're a lot easier to install, but if you don't reinforce them properly afterwards, 
quite frankly, they're not going to hold up as well. So with that, let's move on to issue number two, which is more weight being added behind the wall because there is inadequate drainage. Drainage is going to be the number one killer of a retaining wall. If you have a wall that is even a little bit less strong, but it has really good drainage, chances are that will hold up much better than a very strong wall that has no drainage whatsoever. And where the drainage is needed most is in the area immediately behind the wall, because if it builds up there, it's pressing directly against the wall, especially if it freezes and expands. But generally speaking, the closer the source of the weight is directly to the wall, the higher up on the wall it's going to push, which means the more torque it's going to apply, thereby making it more likely to knock it over or chip it away over time. As you can see on my wall, I have no drainage whatsoever, and I have hard packed dirt all the way pressing against the back of this wall. And I don't know if you know this about compact dirt, water doesn't flow extraordinarily well through it, which means it is atrocious if you're trying to get the water to drain. So for the bulk of you who have probably never built a retaining wall before, you're asking yourself, what is the correct way to do it then? Well, depending on where you live, the requirements are going to change. You're supposed to have a minimum of 12 inches of gravel, which is a coarse gravel that allows the water to flow through directly behind the retaining wall. One thing you might be wondering though, is if you have a gravel backfill behind your wall, how do you prevent dirt from flowing into that gravel and then clogging it up, thereby making that mat not really drain well? And the answer to this is pretty simple. They make a landscaping mat specifically for that purpose. You put it up against the dirt before you pour the gravel in, and what it does is allows the water to go through, but filters out the dirt so that the dirt doesn't clog up any of your drainage system. And depending on the footing of your retaining wall as well, most places require a gravel footing, with the goal being that water can go underneath and drain out into the ground below. And the other thing that most areas require, especially for taller or longer walls, is a drain drainage pipe that goes within that gravel backfill. This is just a perforated pipe, which is a pipe with a bunch of holes in it. So when the water comes down, it can go into this pipe and this pipe has a slight angle to it so that it goes out to a drain hole rather than having to completely saturate the ground below it. Because again, the dirt below isn't necessarily the best material for draining out water. So by having a designated drain pipe built in that can take the water to a different place, that can help alleviate a lot of water buildup, especially during heavy storms or during a spring thaw when you have a ton of snow melting at once. And if you haven't already figured it out, I have none of these for drainage. What they did do for quote unquote drainage was turn this one single cinder block at the bottom sideways in the hopes that the water might drain through the dirt and out of that one point. Something I want to note is that that wasn't even the lowest part of the wall, so there was no reason to assume that that was where the water would build up. But as you can see, they didn't use any landscape mat there either, so over time, the dirt just filled up that entire hole. And not only did it look absolutely atrocious, but there was 0% chance that any water would flow out of it because of how much dirt was built up in there. And as I said earlier in the video, another way that you can have extra weight added too close to the retaining wall is if you have plants growing, specifically larger trees. They get pretty heavy pretty quickly. And the amount of wood that's in a 60 foot tall tree, it's a lot. And the weight of it is thousands and thousands and thousands of pounds. You can see this on a smaller scale in one section of my retaining wall where I had a large bush growing directly behind it. The wall did get pushed out a little bit in that area, partially from the roots pushing against the back of this, but also from the weight of the bush itself. So if you like maintaining a garden, you like planting trees, maybe just don't do it directly behind your retaining wall. So here's the big synopsis, is this wall was definitely not built properly, but the reason that it really failed was that it was underbuilt plus it had no drainage behind it, so the weight behind it, and the water behind it, and the pressure of the water freezing during the harsh winters here, gradually overpowered this wall to the point that it could no longer stand on its own. And the biggest reason for that is because there was absolutely no drainage built into this retaining wall. Even with the wall built the way that it was, had there been proper drainage here, it would have probably doubled the lifespan of this retaining wall, which only lasted about seven to 10 years. The most durable way to build a retaining wall so that it has the longest life possible is to give it as much drainage as you possibly can. That's ultimately what's going to give you the best bang for your buck and the most longevity out of a retaining wall. Now why would somebody build a wall this terrible with so little drainage and with such inadequate support? Well the answer 
is because of cost. Gravel costs money, cinder blocks cost money, rebar costs money, and concrete costs money. To add in the drainage pipe or to add in the gravel backfill, it might only be a couple hundred dollars, but the reality is it's still several hundred dollars. The person who owned my house before me was renting it out. This was a rental property to them. They didn't care about longevity. They just needed this thing to stand up long enough for them to sell the house. And is that the right way to do it? Absolutely not. They're effectively going to cost me an extra five to seven thousand dollars in materials just to do this myself because they didn't want to spend an extra five to seven hundred dollars of materials doing it properly the first time. And granted, does it take a little bit longer to do things like add the gravel in? Sure it does, but if you were to get a small loader back there with the gravel, it would only take you a couple of hours to do the entire thing. But there you have it, a big lesson on how not to build a retaining wall unless you really want it to fall over. That'll do it for this episode. Thank you for watching, and I will see you next time.